Welcome to Discover Ag, where every week we discover what's new in the world of agriculture. We're your hosts, Natalie Kaborik and Tara Vanerdusen, and together we bring you our professional farming opinion on a variety of trending topics in the ag and food space. Where ag, you can relate to. Back with episode 77 of Discover Ag, the last episode of March, and it is brought to you by Case IH to the men and women at Case IH, Farming is a Way of Life, a life they live every day on millions of acres across North America. Get to know the farmers who work at Case IH and see how they bring that perspective into everything Case IH does. Visit builtbyfarmers.com to see their stories and even share your own. Built by Farmers. Case IH, a proud sponsor of the Discover Ag podcast. You know, I have faced a lot of trying things in my life, challenging moments, things that have tested my will, but I swear nothing is harder than a podcast intro. Why is it so (laughs) darn awkward? It is so hard. I feel like once it gets going, it's fine, but just like kicking it off, whoo, those nerves, they're real. We're going to be the podcast that everyone's like, just give them their one minute yeah. to the intro. It gets really good. We promise the meat of the episode is there. Their intros are awkward. That'll just, be ours. Just get through Tag. it. Get through it, people. Get through the first 30 seconds and you'll be fine. <laughs> so I saw something really cool on Twitter that I want to talk about. Of course, it was Twitter. About, I know. My vice. I tweeted it this was, weekend, by the way. I, I commented. Look, well, I, I think I said, well, 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 look who's tweeting. Mm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> so it was about Loretta Lynn being a promoter of soil conservation. So the NRCS account actually tweeted an old radio ad commercial she did on soil conservation. And I'll be darned if I just didn't love it. I I feel like um I, I, I love that country western singers typically. That's like a generalization, but I love that they like are bringing awareness to agriculture. Like I feel like they're the only ones out there doing the work like that and so thank you Loretta Lynn for caring about our soils rest in peace but um yeah I agree actually when I was at the American Rodeo and Cody Johnson was the performer he actually gave a really great shout out he I didn't realize he's um I don't know the level of production acts he's involved into but he was talking about like calving season and I felt like he was his terminology and verbiage was very indicative that he's like involved in agriculture beyond just like the country lifestyle and the songs. But it got me thinking this article. Well, a couple things. First off, I listening to the ad, I feel like it made me realize that the rudimentary things about certain, I guess, areas of agriculture are the same, right? So the things that Loretta Lynn was talking about in that commercial, I'm not sure the year of it but it was about soil health obviously and some of the things were exactly the same it was like promoting cover crops it was you know rotational um rotating your crops it was basic things that i feel like we're still educating and promoting and encouraging today and i don't know i just thought it i actually made one of our articles we talk about later on kind of the same thing but i'm like nature is so neat in some areas that it's it when you treat it properly it's designed to take care of itself it's just about being so in tune with what nature needs i don't know i just thought it was really neat um i would love to know what year it was produced just about soil health and cover crops but i agree like Mm -hmm. the foundation of what we care about in ag has never changed like i think it it kind of goes to why like sometimes i feel like farmers are like oh we're talking about sustainability like funny we've kind of been talking about that for hundreds of years uh and it goes like, like loretta lynn was talking about that in the 60s why are yeah. we so, <laughs> why are we so have it? we not solved this problem yet <laughs> yeah. uh, oh. the other rabbit hole it led me down though i feel like i need a shirt that says rabbit hole um we have a few kind of shirts what you, we need to make work on it yeah um but it's kind of what you talked about when you first said it is the tie of you know, country artists to farming and ranching. Cause Loretta Lynn made me think about Elvis, which I'm like, Oh yeah, he had a ranch. Like he was really involved. And then I was like, who else was? And then it made me think of Cody Johnson, which I already talked about. So then I started Googling and I found this fun little article. I want to go through it. Can we go through famous people who farm? I think it'd be fun. Yeah. You sent it to me. So I'm ready. Okay. So first up is Calvin Harris. He has a 130 acre farm on the Spanish Island of Ibiza. Um, and it's said to be Ibiza's largest organic farm. 
That one really surprised me. I did not expect, you know, I've seen Calvin Harris like in Vegas live. And that is just, I'm not picturing him on like an organic farm in Ibiza, if I'm being honest. I, I don't, the amount of like narcotics going through the Vegas club just doesn't scream organic to me. Okay, we have Chris Pratt. I, I like definitely I knew mentioned. that one. I, I, I feel like that one's a pretty crush. famous one. Yeah. But yeah, they he has a farm in Washington State and he tries to spend a ton of time up there. Yeah. Um, Russell Crowe. Yeah, and his is like not small. Like his is like 500 acres in Australia. I feel like a lot of the Australian actors have some land though. Mm-hmm. Like ones that still live there. Like I feel like in Australia, it's like a thing to have like an Australian ranch. The article said that he didn't attend the 2020 Globes because Golden Globes because he stayed home. Their bushfires were going on. And I was like, I look know. at you out Russell there Crow, doing the dedicated work. little rancher. I yeah. thought it was funny. They also said that um, he invited Oprah to visit and showed off his 500 cows. <laughs> it's so <laughs> funny the way they wrote showed off. <laughs> Just um, casually had okay. Oprah over. Uh huh. Let's see. Who else do we have here? Um, Khalees. Yep. Which, going back to Calvin Harris, like when I listen to I'm Bossy, not thinking farmer. So, okay, this one, though, and a few of these, but I'll start with her. Okay, she has 24 acres in Temecula, California. We actually know a strawberry farmer in Temecula. Um, but some of these, I wish they had said, like, it's a hobby farm or it's yeah. like, I feel like there's a lot of places in California. Like, Daniel has an uncle who has a few acres and they, like, have... Um, olives but like they don't class they're not farmers like they have like someone comes in and manages Mm. the olives they turn it into like a couple bottles of olive oil we usually get one for christmas like i love it don't get me wrong but i'm just like i think that's a little different than like uh, like i wish they had clarified kind of like i think it just gave people if you were reading this you'd be like oh my gosh like i can farm with one of them, it was like five acres. I was like, that's like, I'm not saying that's like not land, but I also don't think that's like commercial farming. Like, I think there's a difference. Oh, a hundred percent. But I think in the minds of consumers reading this article, I don't know if they know care. that it mattered. I know, and I yeah. think that's. But it, I was like, but this is leading to like, un, like not understand, not a good understanding of agriculture. Hmm, that's interesting. I think we have different viewpoints on this. Mm, okay let's keep going i think it's making farming cool again yeah but i but i i think there's the the romanticized version of farming and then there's also like what it actually takes to farm like you're not feeding people on your five acre hobby farm celebrity mr celebrity like that's where i think it leads to a problem it's funny you say that because the one about mark ruffalo um, he is a 50 acre ranch in upstate New York. And the, what they wrote is it includes a vegetable garden, a barn, and he's been known to grow strawberries. Like, <laughs> right. Ex- okay. Exactly. <laughs> like he has a garden. Like that is not a farm. Like I'm just, <laughs> that is exactly my point. <laughs> um, I know, Martha- but go ahead. Uh, I was going to say Martha Stewart's on this list. I feel like that one's not surprising to me. No, I skip by her. The one that I, I found Hayden Christensen very surprising. Um, Blake Shelton wasn't. I feel like that's a really people are aware of him. Kanye, I didn't realize when they were going to Wyoming, they were visiting his ranch. I thought they were visiting like dude ranches or very high end, you know, resorts. Um, I didn't realize he actually owned the property. And then Dennis Quaid. I didn't. Um, he's close to home for me. He's in Paradise Valley, which is like right kind of not right where I grew up, but very close. Um, and John Mayer actually spends a ton of time there. Like when they, a couple of years ago, he put on a, a proceeds concert there. Like John Mayer spends a ton of time in that area. Uh, what was the boy band Harry Styles was in? This is going to show how old I am. Oh, I don't his, know. One of his, one of his singer people in that band. Um, he has a farm and I, that one surprised me too. When he talked about it in GQ. Um, oh, the guy that dates uh, Gigi Haddad. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he has cherries, tomatoes, and cucumbers. So I thought that one was good. Maybe they came up with the song "Watermelon" on his farm. I think that song is about something else, Natalie. But we oh. will have to talk about that <laughs> on a different episode. Oh that is, we are a PG podcast. <laughs> oh. oh man! So anyway, oh. it's a really funny list. Um, we should share it to discover stories. Lots of fun. There's lots of things in there. 
Uh, well, thank you for enlightening me, apparently, and as well as letting <laughs> us enlighten our audience, too. All right. We've got some big topics. That I know. Let us know what they are. <laughs> Maybe we should get down to business, huh? Yeah. Okay. The top three trending topics this week in the ag and food space that you need to know are, number one, the Biden administration pledges $25 million to bring bison back to tribal lands. This one, um, I... The person who's pushing this is actually Secretary Deb Holland, and she was from New Mexico. Biden selected her for New Mexico. She was one of our representatives or senators. Um, and so I kind of deep dived that part of this story. I just can't believe how quickly we turned here from. <laughs> we need we to work on our segues. 30, 45 <laughs> seconds, and it really, this podcast really took a different turn. <laughs> we really, we need to work on segues. That's all I have to say. My note I wrote down for this was bison's back. All right. Because that's all I can think of when I see bring bison back. I don't know why. I was thinking this morning how we need some fun jingles. Like I wish one of us could sing and like jingle into things, but I cannot sing. So I will not do that. (laughs) Moving in in a non-jingle way to the next topic. California crops lost after floods. How much of the U.S. will feel the shortage? I'm going to be coming in hot with some, lots of facts and t- statistics. This one, I think, is going to be the bulk of we need to give time. There's a lot to cover on this. I have a lot to say about bison's back all right. So it's just going to be a longer episode. You guys settle in, get comfy, get comfy. keep driving. I don't know. Make a couple extra loops. Do whatever you need to do to keep it on. Our third <laughs> one is PepsiCo commits $216 million for regenerative agriculture products projects. Yeah, our friend, um, the the chief sustainability officer for Pepsi, Jim Andrews, was quoted in this, and we we had dinner with him once. I say friend, I like very sarcastically, but um, <laughs> Listen, we know we him. Marshmallows, we uh, roasted, we, not grilled. We roasted, we roasted marshmallows. marshmallows. We are long lifelong friends. I actually hope he's not tuning in because I'm going to slam this article. I don't know why, but I have problems with it. Hmm, I do not. So we are gonna yeah. disagree. This is going to be an episode of us arguing. I know. Lots of fun stuff coming up, you guys. Um, You know what else is fun? Our giveaway. We do this every single month to say thank you for tuning in and sharing the podcast. If you are a new listener, first off, hello. Welcome. We're so happy you're here. But second, uh, we want you to know that every single month we pick one person who has shared the Discover Pod to social channels or left us a review, and we send you a goodie bag. So as you're listening today, this is your reminder, you guys, share as you listen. Sharing is caring. All right, diving into article number one, title Biden administration pledges 25 million to bring bison back to tribal lands. The United States government is redoubling its efforts to restore bison populations to Native American lands. Interior Secretary Deb Holland released an order last week establishing a six member federal working group on American bison restoration. The group, which will be composed of representatives from five federal agencies and one tribal leader, is charged with creating a, quote, shared stewardship plan by the end of the year to increase bison populations on lands managed by the federal government and tribal nations. So I mentioned that Secretary Holland is from New Mexico. She, fun fact about her, she is the first Native American to serve as a cabinet secretary. So when she was appointed to that position, it was a very big deal. And obviously she was appointed with the goal of working with tribal lands and um, Native American cultures, bringing back culture. So I feel like this is not... That's surprising knowing that was kind of like the push and the focus of her appointment. No, and I think from an environmental standpoint, this is good. I think, feel like there was actually a lot of positive sound bites from, I don't know, a conservation standpoint. They talked about like stomping the soil with the hooves, native plant restoration, breaking up the soil for new growth. I mean, all the things we talk about when it comes to cattle, they talked about wildfire mitigation, which I thought was great, you know, sequestering carbon. Okay, so that brings me to my first point. I love all of these environmental advocates applaud the initiative as a climate solution that Mm -hmm. cattle stomping, blah, blah, blah. All the things you just listed are climate solutions. I'm like sitting there like, wait, am I crazy? Do we not hear from climate activists all the time that like cattle are destroying the planet? I'm like, so all the things we've been telling you that cattle do a great job of. Now you're saying bison also do a great job of that. So like, which is it? Like, yeah, flag on the play. For yes. sure. What is that but, um, legally blonde quote? It was like, am I 
stepping on glue here or did we not get into the same college like that's what I think like have we not been saying the same thing so I think that brings up an interesting point because you're right they the first part of the article praises again really great sound bites sound bites to introduce people to the idea of how these ruminants can play a role in the environment how they're needed how they're part of the cycle part of the ecosystem again everything we preach and say and then they'll end it like there i pulled out a quote that said since the history is intertwined with the prairies ecologists view their reintroduction as key to restoring the country's grassland an estimated half of which has already been lost to cattle crops and development like they they in the same sentence they pitted bison against cattle in it but um i think it begs the question are we which is such a sad sad standpoint for us to be in but do we just be happy that we're bringing drawness and attention to, is it like our Trojan horse where we can slip, you know, things like this in get people aware of it, talking about it, understanding it, and then like connect the dots later for them? Or do we sit here and be a little annoyed with like a bad taste in our mouth? So I think it's going to be fine until it's not. I feel like at some point this is going to, there's going to be a flip, a switch that's flipped and they're going to be like, oh, we reintroduced bison, the population is thriving, and then it will be, oh my goodness, what is the carbon footprint of bison? Because I saw another article about moose in Norway and how large their carbon footprint was. And I was like, are we seriously talking about the carbon footprint of like moose? And I was like, this is going to... I just felt like it was the writing on the wall for bison one day, like in 20 years from now when our bison population is hopefully thriving, like... People are going to be like, wait, what's the carbon footprint of a bison? Which I'm sure it's a lot considering how big they are. Yeah, we were actually going to cover moose first as the topic of contention or like as a, a point here. And then we came across this bison one. But the the moose one is so interesting because in my mind, and it goes back to also wolves, um, basically any type of wildlife, I guess is the right word. Um. I feel like we're trying to play God. Like wolves have literally, I'm listening to the most fascinating podcast right now about kind of just the history of basically the evolution of how we went from where we were to where we are now and delisting and, and relisting wolves. And they have been delisted and relisted so many times. It's like, okay, things are good. Okay. Now things are bad. Okay. Things are good. And now they're bad. And it's just like, uh, what's that Michael Scott quote when he's like, snip, snap, snip, snap. And he's like, <laughs> we're just going back and forth because what's, what's the magic number? Where do we draw the line? And it's what you were just getting at with bison. It's like, what's the magic number of reinstating this population before it becomes a problem? Because it will be a problem. I actually know I was finding a ton of articles just because I, I loved this. I don't know. I don't know if it's because where I grew up or what, but like this whole topic is really fascinating to me. But reinstating and having these ranches of buffalo bison um it's not easy you know they're going to be butted up to other operations you have to have management they're going to be breaking fences they're going to be grazing they had a lot of viewpoints of ranchers who have issues with this and one of the article even like called out montana saying montana republican they're not going to yeah, support I saw it that one but we actually know um someone in the black hills area or sorry someone in um i'm going to talk about black hills in a second we know someone who ranches in South Dakota. And so they're next to the Rosebud, um, reservation. And there are one of these and it's not managed well. There's a lot of problems with it. And I had a follower when she saw we were going to cover this, she messaged in about one of the black Hills that is not going well either. And so sometimes I feel like we want to have our cake and eat it too. Like people envision this bison roaming the earth, like they did, you know, how many ever years ago. And it's like, well, we colonized, we industrialized, we screwed this up, you know, like, hi, it's us. We're the problem. We can't just have these grays roaming around everywhere. And so that's like, where's the balance between the right number, the wrong number. And, and when do we call that? Yeah. So I um, recorded a podcast last week with Dr. Drew and oddly enough, he brought up bison and how difficult they are to manage, like, cause he enjoys bison, like meat. And, and he was talking about how you have to have massive in infrastructure to like contain bison. Otherwise they will like run rampant. They can hurt, you know, obviously property, like property damage, um, hurt other animals, whether that be cattle or other animals. Uh, and so I, it's kind of interesting that we ended up covering that this week because he and I kind of ended up down, as you would love to say, a rabbit hole with that one. I love that we're casually having a conversation about the casual conversation you have with Dr. <laughs> Drew. So amazing. I'm so excited for that podcast to drop. You guys, everyone is going to have to go listen to it. I, I hope it, I hope it turns out as good as I, I think it went in my head. He had lots of great questions. Um, 
One thing I wanted to mention is I know I feel like uh, Dr. Mittlerner talks about this, but the number there used to be about 60 million bison. And so when people do talk about cattle, it's always interesting to refer back to that because we have like comparable, if not like less than in like animal units, because obviously bison are bigger than cattle, um, cattle grazing now. So, like, our ruminant animal levels have stayed very consistent across North America, which I find fascinating from an ecology and environmental standpoint. Yeah, it's one of our favorite talking points to bring up when people have an argument about, like, the amount of meat we're raising now or cattle that are on the land. And, again, going back to, like, a methane carbon standpoint, like, ruminants haven't changed much. I guess the animal has changed, which they do. I was talking to Luke a little bit about, the grazing habits of bison versus cows they're they're definitely more of like a herd animal because the one of the articles was like talking about it tried to paint how cattle would just literally sit in one spot and graze away and they'd ruin the environment and like differences I guess between bison and cattle and I so I was talking to Luke about it and he's like well bison are definitely more of which I saw a chart of the territory they cover I didn't realize how far they roam so they're definitely more of a roaming animal cattle would still roam slightly and and that's the whole obviously thought process behind like land management, stewardship management, like right. we're pushing rotational cattle and doing rotational grazing. grazing to mimic the Buffalo. So yeah, it may not be like one for one on their own, the exact same, but we can mimic the same thing that cat or r- Buffalo were doing with cattle. I think that's a really good point. I never had thought about that. Thank you, Luke, for coming in with that mm-hmm. thought train of thought. Um, what else you got for us? That's kind of all I had. Nothing. I pulled out this little section about, um, again, going back to how neat nature works. They were talking about wallowing, which is when buffalo roll on the ground. And then they listed all the beneficial things for it. And again, it just remained like it gave me an appreciation again for like nature and animals and just how creation works when we stay out of it. It just does a really beautiful job of, you know, being harmonized. And and yeah. I think that goes back to the bigger thing with even like wolves and this reintroduction. It's like when we insert us into this puzzle, which we have done as we have progressed through society, it changes things. So thinking we're going to go back to Buffalo, you know, large herds, which they're beautiful to look at. I wouldn't mind it. But if we're going to go back to like these large herds, just hanging out as we're driving down I-90, like not going to work, not going to happen. My mom's big dream for her life is to have two Buffalo grazing in her back pasture (laughs) so far she has not talked my dad into that (laughs) so but she thinks also it'd be so pretty to be able to watch them (laughs) they're very have you ever seen them in real life yeah we uh there's a like ranch north of clovis that has one Hmm. they're very i mean they're very beautiful they are very beautiful all right our second industry news piece you guys need to know this week the title, California Crops Lost After Floods, How Much of the U.S. Will Feel the Shortage. Too much rain is sinking farmers' bottom line across California's central coast. The area some call America's salad bowl more resembles a soup bowl as round after round of atmospheric river-fueled storms overwhelmed farmland. We all may start to notice a difference in the grocery store as some staples become harder to find. So I'm going to give just a couple facts for people that maybe haven't seen these. But California grows about half of the United States fruits and vegetables. It's They grow over 90% of the almonds, walnuts, pistachios, broccoli, strawberries, grapes, and tomatoes. They grow over 70% of our lettuce. They are the number one producer of raspberry and cauliflower. They produce 20% of the U.S. dairy. And that's like just scratching the surface. But those are some of the big numbers. Like this is... They produce a massive amount of our food in this country. Um, I think probably my first spot I want to start with is there has literally been no news coverage of this in my mind. No news, no state of emergency, no big mention from the governor about what's going Mm -hmm. on. No big bailouts, not to get into the banks, but like the only thing we're seeing coming out of California right now is people bailing out banks. Where is the help for farmers? Yeah, I did not realize how little the, um, I don't know, I guess government, overarching word, is being involved in this. You know, we have obviously friends that are in California. And then I put up a story or a question box in my stories for California producers to write in and just give their personal testimonies, which we can get into a little bit later on. Um but yeah, there was some complaints about the awareness around this, the help behind this, um, whether it's from like a physical manual standpoint or 
a financial standpoint. Um, there is that real going around of the National Guard. <laughs> pushing, yeah. Hey, out of the, um, the helicopter, though. <laughs> um, so I found some of the facts about what is like the rainfall right now. The last four year or what, I think it was uh, one of our friends that we talked to said the last three out of four years they have actually four received out of seven four out of seven thank you years they have received over average rainfall and yet still been classified as a drought because of their storage problems in California yeah. of being able to store water our since you're a water expert can you elaborate on that a little bit more like what state would be comparable like was California super unique in the aspect that they would have to have water storage capacity are they behind compared to like another state that would have to do this or I mean we're not uh, I'm just very confused about that we're not storing water here in Nebraska do you know what I'm saying yeah I'm are we? confused by that too New Mexico I mean maybe we should be storing water because we have a water crisis in New Mexico <laughs> but we're getting a lot of our water from groundwater whereas California gets a lot more from surface water rainwater like the runoff um, and the snow melt. So it is different. I mean, they are pumping out of the aquifer, but I think I would guess there's regu- more regulation. On it. I don't know. I would love someone. I am not familiar with California, like water rights situation. I th- so I think that's why I'm confused because if you're a state, like you said, we're relying on, on like underground water. We have the Okalala Oliver. We talked, I did not say that right, but whatever. Moving on. Um, we talked about that before about um, how we're how pulling we, from that. Yeah. But so if a, a state can't, you think they would understand the importance of having the water capacity. Hold. Like you think that this infrastructure would be built there from a long time ago. Like, I don't understand why we're dealing with this now. And I'm yeah, sure every California producer is like, call, you know, preach into the choir now. <laughs> 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 yeah. So some of the facts I did see about the rain, they have received 32 trillion gallons of rain over three weeks. Um, the Salinas Valley usually receives 15 inches of rain in a year. They've received that in three weeks. Yeah. So they've received their entire year fall in three weeks. And this is actually just the beginning. They're like, this is not even close to the end. A lot of the other counties, they're preparing them for flooding as things continue to like move downstream and as snow melt starts happening like we haven't even started dealing with snow melt when the snow starts melting there's going to be even more flooding so i saw um a few i think king county is like you need to be figuring out what your evacuation strategy is what you're going to do because the water's coming it's not like if it comes it's when it comes yeah i saw a news clip on that and it was really heartbreaking so nebraska flooded gosh i don't know sometime when jacks was really little so five five years ago maybe um and man water is it's 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 well yeah it's just a really i mean i don't want to like pin it against other you know forces of nature elements of nature but it's a really helpless feeling the water coming in and not knowing what to do and to be in the position of some of those counties where they're like it's not a matter of when it's if so get prepared you're like prepare how like where do i move my cattle what what do you want me to do to prepare to lose everything how do you properly prepare to be like well we're gonna lose the barn we're gonna lose this you know it's it's such a terrible feeling. So speaking of cattle evacuation, I'm glad you brought that up because Tulare County is home to 330, 330, 100,000 dairy cows. Did I say that right? A ton. Hundreds of thousands of dairy cows. That's what we're going to A roll. lot. It's got a lot. <laughs> a lot of dairy cows. Um, and they a are- cro- A crop ton. It's got a, a crop ton. Oh, yeah. It's a crop ton. <laughs> it, it, it's a cow. How would I say it with cow cows? Ton. A cow ton. It's a cow ton. <laughs> lots and lots of cows. Um, so they're having to evacuate all these dairy cattle. And it's not as simple. Like a moving beef cattle would also be complicated. But dairy cattle are so much more complicated because they have to keep milking. You have to milk a cow at least every 12 hours. So you have to find a place, not just a pen to put them in, but you have to find a place that can milk them and like is set up for them calving. I mean, we calve all year round. It's extremely complicated to move dairy cattle. It Like I remember when my family moved our herd from California to New Mexico like we had to stop at an empty dairy somewhere along the way and milk our cows and reload them and then like continue. Like it's a really big process. This is not just like you wake up and you're like, let's load the cattle, get them on trailers and move them. And so I cannot imagine all of these cows that are having to be moved. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't quite understand where we are moving them all to or, you know, yeah, what either. You, like I said, I don't quite understand what they're actually supposed to do. And, and going back to when we talked to, you know, whether it's our friends there or other people, but a lot of them are saying these will be effects that we see for, you know, multiple years, if not 
you know, beyond that because of the long standing consequences of this. So some of the dairies, what they're doing is they're a little bit overstocking their pens. Like there's obviously a stocking rate with how many cows you put in each pen. They're kind of overstocking. They're changing from milking three times a day to two times a day because then you can milk more cows. Um, The fairgrounds are opening up. Like if the fairgrounds are not flooded, a bunch of the county fairgrounds are opening up their pens for cattle that don't need to be milked that just need some place to stay. So there's a lot going on. Um, From the crop side, like the – produce side I guess I thought this was really interesting they cannot even if you were to salvage some of the crops you have to throw it away because if it has been touched by floodwaters there is the risk of E. coli and so you have to Mm -hmm. get rid of absolutely everything no matter what condition it's in yeah so that's something that I thought the article or at least one of the articles I was reading did a good job of highlighting again we think of like the immediate the immediate damage or the immediate outcomes of things and we don't think about like the process afterwards or like the long-term effects unless you were in California you're thinking about this but they were just talking about even after this again going back to how I mentioned like this is going to be a year multiple year thing because they were talking about how long replanting would take because they're going to have to like reassess the fields and then you know determine exactly what was damaged as far as infrastructure and then there's all this testing that has to be done to the soils to to sample things and then all the equal like there's just this whole long process so it's not like the ground dries up and we're like okay hurry get stuff back in the ground and let's plant again you know it's like there's this process and I feel like that's in everything in agriculture like you think about how long it takes to get like you know cattle from beginning to end it's like I think people think, especially in our society, it's like such an immediacy grasp. Like we're attached to the idea of like Amazon two days, like things so quick, so fast. And it's like an agriculture. That's not the way it works. Years. No, it is such a long process, which just makes it, I mean, again, why we go back to like mental health problems in agriculture. Okay. So that actually brings me to my last point is the amount of negative comments online. I went down Twitter comment section and it is I got crazy. my first mean comment Ooh. on a tweet I'm like oh I'm making it on Twitter <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Twitter because that's what it's yeah. known for is being I mean <laughs> I'm um, ready for it is there were so many comments like you know the farmers are pumping the aquifer dry so like you know the flooding is like you're kind of just like you deserve it almost like it was and I'm like if you have eaten a almond walnut pistachio broccoli strawberry grape you know the entire list of all the things California produces where do you think that comes from and what like it uses resources like I just was like you have to eat we have to feed people I don't understand that attitude of like well you created like you used the water now it's flooding sorry about your bad luck it was really disheartening I saw a lot of negative comments too but just about air yeah it's not um it's not, not good. sympathetic Mm-mm. no not at all. I mean, you're talking about people that are like losing their livelihoods. Uh, a lot of these, you know, I don't know. There was no sympathy. And I was just like, if you eat food, you should have sympathy for the California farmers right now. Well, and you should be concerned and care too. Also, if you eat food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and with the rate of inflation on food already, I can't imagine what like next year's grocery prices are going to be. So another interesting thing, going back to like when I had, uh, followers from uh, California message in someone brought up well lots of very valuable points were brought up but one brought up which I again my mind did not even go there but they were talking about how the regrowth is going to be a problem after all of this because California it's going to be fire control there's going to be burning problems California will not manage it like they're supposed to and she's like the regrowth is going to be a huge issue and I was like Oh, man. So they're going to have a super bloom coming up. It's like kind of already happening. The super bloom has started. So it is going to be gorgeous to go visit California for a while if you're not in the, you know, underwater. Um, But yes, the fire control after that is going to be unbelievable. I was in California last week with my parents and my dad and I were talking about how green it was. And that was the first thing he said was, well, it's probably all going to catch on fire in a few months. That'll be the next headline we see out of California. And I was like, oh, my gosh, that's terrible to think about. I feel really bad for California producers. We were talking with one of our friends and I was like, I think I need an economic lesson because she was talking about how much they rank in output and their contribution, but, but how low they are in the actual GDP. Yes. That was, I was like mind blowing. When I first read her blowing. text, I was like, oh, ag is the second largest um, GDP in California. And then I reread it and it was, it was the second to last. So it is mm-hmm. one of the lowest. That's why nobody 
in California, like the California government does not care about ag is because even though it's huge and it is like the salad bowl of the United States, it doesn't make a dent compared to all the other industries in California, which is Mm -hmm. crazy to think about. So if anyone is listening as a California producer and you have thoughts about this that you want to be shared, please message us on the Discover Ag platform. Um, We will be shared there and then we can share um, our personal stories too, some of them. So if you guys have things that you want added to this conversation, obviously Tara and I are trying to bring awareness to it, give our perspective of, you know, our female millennial farming perspective to it. But uh, we're over here in Nebraska and New Mexico. So our voices shouldn't be the ones that are like, you know, sharing, speaking Mm -hmm, for it so we want to hear from you guys go uh, let us know your thoughts um, either on our personal pages or on the discover ag page all right our third and final industry news piece you guys need to know this week is the title pepsico commits 216 million for regenerative agriculture projects pepsico has announced a multi-year 216 million commitment in support of strategic partnerships with practical farmers of iowa pfi soil and water outcomes fund swof and the illinois corn growers association icga to drive adoption of regenerative agriculture practices across the united states so one of the things that this article we were reading two different articles and you ended up sending me the one you had they were identical like it went back we've talked about this before that like literally one person writes an article and then every other outlet just copies and pastes it onto their website it was the quotes were exactly the same i was like i guess it doesn't matter which one we were reading because they had nothing different than the other ones i was kind of disappointed to see that once again i feel like i'm numb to it now yeah maybe i'll get there after this one okay so let's hear your issues with this because i think you feel very passionately (laughs) about this no i think i feel the same but different same same but different (laughs) so normally you would get what you get from me is that i think this is great that corporations like this are leading the charge and they're working with farmers and i love to see you know investment in regenerative agriculture and the practices and awareness around it and money, most importantly, money being funneled into money. it. We talk about that a lot. We need money in ag, in ag research. <sighs> Help us. We're poor. <laughs> <laughs> but for some reason, this article rubbed you the wrong just way. Rubbed me the wrong way. I felt like it was a PR sound bo- sound bite, typical down good. I don't know what about it, but I could not read it without being so annoyed at the statements, the claim. Like I felt like it was just like it, it actually made me sit back and cause some of the things I say when we're like on guests of podcasts about, you know, farming and agriculture. And it made me double think about the Burbridge and how I talk about our industry. Oh, interesting. Gave you some like self-reflection, huh? Of whether you sound kind of PRE, like a PR stunt. Yes. And just things consumers don't want to hear anymore. And I don't even like the word consumer. I don't know why I always use that. I feel like it's what slips out of my mouth. But, you know, people who are removed from agriculture, this isn't what they want to hear. I feel like it's stereotypes that lead further into the perpetuation of like, okay, big ag, PepsiCo, using little ag, regenerative that doesn't exist. Like it just was, I just did not like the way it was written. Obviously at the core of this, I like the idea of a PepsiCo trying to be more sustainable and working through farmers, like working hand in hand with farmers to do that. But the way this was written, I feel like if I was a a normal person living in LA, just, I would not only read it wrong. I don't feel like it would actually turn me on to regenerative av or make a difference for how I feel about PepsiCo. I wish someone could see our text message thread because you were heated in our (laughs) about this. I was not heated. You just said, okay, so for everyone listening, Tara picked this article. So this is what we do every Friday during the week. We gather everything we see into a Trello board. We work through Trello. We drop them in there. We get together on Friday, say, okay, which three do we want to do? And I don't know. You like this one. And I was like, well, I don't like it, but we can cover it and I can be devil's advocate. And that's all I said. I was not fired up. (laughs) She was like breathing fire through the text message. And I'm just kidding you guys. Um, Okay. So I feel like... Uh, My point is, like, I'm not surprised. I think this goes back to, um, you know, 
PepsiCo has a net zero initiative. How are they going to get there? There's only one industry on the planet that removes carbon from the atmosphere. It's farming. So that's obviously who they're going to team up with is farmers. I love to see money getting invested into ag. So I guess I'm going to say all the PR things that you're going to say. <laughs> but one of the things that I am a big stand for is I believe in keeping carbon credits in the food supply chain. And mm-hmm. PepsiCo would be doing that. We wouldn't be selling our carbon credits to like an airlines. So I like that piece of it. Um, some things that I thought were interesting about PepsiCo, uh, PepsiCo is the largest food and beverage company in the U.S. And it is the second largest beverage company in the world. But that like, mm-hmm. I mean, I think I knew that, but still hearing like even worldwide, like this is a massive company. Um, it almost made me wonder, could they be doing more? Like, I don't, don't want to think- like say that like I don't want to be the you know the guy like with the offering plate that like shakes it in front of the people that should be like you know having a larger <laughs> offering but like that's kind of yeah that's kind of what I had in my mind was like hey PepsiCo like woo 200 million like but at the same time I'm glad to see it I don't know I guess I, I don't want to be like beggars can't be choosers but I want to see money invested in ag so I'm happy about it but I agree with you. This is a PR stunt to make Pepsi look less bad. Like, oh, we're working with, you know, these little regenerative farms. Like, I feel like that was the attitude of it. So at its core, I don't know that it was, like, in the right place. But I think, I hope that the ag people they're working with benefit from it. The well, I think they, they paired with. So those are also some of my feelings come into it. I do feel like it's a little bit of greenwashing. And people are aware of this, right? Like, I don't know how PepsiCo isn't aware of this. I think they are. They just don't care. But it's like, I feel like they're just rewrapping, reframing. They just always, like, kind of put out a new little present to, set, like, pacify people. Totally. And I feel like this is the newest one. And back to your statement, again, I am always shocked when I see it in writing. Yes, I know how pep- big PepsiCo is. But when you see the second largest behind Nestle, okay, um, and the revenue they bring in, I do feel like it's like just a little pat on, again, going back to how important agriculture is. I feel like team up with us, like actually team up with us, do something, put some actual money into this, make a difference. Like think about all the plastic PepsiCo is putting into the environment. Like want to talk about carbon footprints. Okay. Like PepsiCo either like get on and do something about this or stop making Pepsi would be a better world if we just didn't have your plastic and your pop anyway, you know? So it's like, I feel like just stop pacifying us and using us, you know, Don't I feel like doing your my using ag. I know I'm like a non pop drinker, so I can easily say that, but I just, like it's like, put your big you boy pants on and right stop, now. stop. I don't know. I just feel like they're, I almost feel like we're their toy a little bit, you know? Yeah. It's like, we don't want to like super invest into you and be involved with you and do all these things with you, but we know you're important enough that we'll kind of just like dangle you this little carrot. Uh-huh. And we take it because we need it because no one else will give us money. Do you want to get even madder? <laughs> all right. Here we go. You mentioned Nestle is the largest food and beverage company in the world. Whenever dairy announced we were going to be net zero, they did this huge initiative. And like, we are teaming up with dairy to help them reach that goal. And we are giving them $10 million. (laughs) (laughs) Woo. And again, like I say that, like we were super grateful. We were super excited to partner with them. It meant they were investing in the future of dairy in their markets. Like we were super excited about it, but it's like, I wish, but You know, the flip side of the coin is I almost wonder, I did not expect this conversation to go in this direction, but I almost wonder if they were coming in guns blazing, would be, we, would we also be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like you're doing good things. Like (laughs) we're good. We don't need you. Like, so I don't know. Maybe they can't win. Maybe we're just, I don't know. Um, but I, I don't. I, I want to partner with them. I don't want them to be, we'd also be questioning if they were like controlling us. Like there's, Mm -hmm. it's a complicated situation, but I am thankful. We are the problem child. million dollars. (laughs) We are Taylor Swift. Hi. (laughs) So there's lots of singing in this. Wow. (laughs) Really? (laughs) For that awkward intro, we really busted out of our shelves. So I'm trying to find my last note I want to bring up because I thought one of the articles that I was reading did, I don't know, I've never thought about this before. And again, how no one's kind of talking about it, but they were talking about which let me see if I can find the percentage. They were talking about how much a lot of the damage is already coming from carbon in the air. And so yeah. they're like, yeah, it's great that Car- or PepsiCo is talking about like reducing their carbon that they're going to be eventually emitting. But like, what about the carbon that's already there? And I was like, oh, that's an interesting little nugget there. Why yeah. aren't we talking about that? Yeah. Oh, 
I can't find the percentage. I didn't write it down. So that's actually funny that you brought that up because I feel like that's something that, um, not to mention Dr. Mintloner, our favorite person once more, but that's something he talks about with methane. That's why methane is so important is because it has such a shorter lifespan. We can actually do something to remove it. Whereas the existing CO2 in the atmosphere, it's year, you know, decades, hundreds of years before it's going to be able to be removed. Whereas methane, we can make like an actual short term impact on we need to ultimately reduce all CO2 emissions, but like methane actually has a chance to help us out in the more short term. So I just think that's interesting about like the carbon in the atmosphere versus like how long it lives there and then the new carbon we're producing and how long it will live there. So I did not know this and I didn't fact check it, but we're going to put it out there anyway. Put it out Going to back to... And this was kind of when we talked about the episode where we talked about fuel and uh, what airline was that? United? Was it United that was pledging? Yeah. So I do think there are certain corporations that are definitely leading the way. And again, I don't like truly caring about making a difference. So, and I don't know for sure if Microsoft actually cares about making a difference, but they talked about, so they went on to say that like, okay, so PepsiCo, again, we already have carbon in the air. They're just talking about lessening there is like what is pepsi gonna can they do anything will they be doing anything to the carbon already there and then they went on to say that one corporation has already invested in carbon sequestration is microsoft in addition to vowing to be carbon negative by 2030 the software giant will use technology and other methods in order to remove all the carbon the company has already emitted either directly or by electrical consumption since it was founded in 1975 and i thought that is a bold statement to put out there That is you, since you wanted to fact check it, you should just put it on Twitter. Someone will definitely fact check you on it. I'm kind of, I got to ease that since I'm going to get my first negative comments. I'm, I got to pull them back off the brakes a little bit. (laughs) (laughs) Um, No, that's good on uh, Microsoft. It'll be, it will, I will love to see if other companies follow suit. Will that be the next big charge? You know, like we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030 and now we're going to like retroactively work on our previous carbon. The other thing, this one of the articles I was reading talked about was like the future that some of these companies can be working with. And they talked about carbon sequestering concrete and carbon oh, sequestering yeah. plastic, which I thought, um, how interesting. Let's see what comes out of those. I shared on Discover Ag Stories about moss concrete. It's like concrete that grows moss to help sequester more carbon. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Lots of exciting yeah. things happen, but we need money to do it. So we shouldn't be complaining about Pepsi's menial $216 million that they're giving us to do the research. It's so funny that on one hand, we're like, we'll put bison back in to make the environment better. And then the other hand, we're like, and we'll make carbon or moss growing concrete. Like how, <laughs> how <laughs> Very opposite extreme. ends of the spectrum can we be right now on trying to solve the climate issues? <laughs> uh, seriously. Mm. All right. Well, I think that's all we have for you guys this week. How'd we do on time? We're doing Not good. Like 45-ish minutes. Shappy. We we covered some ground too. I'm proud of us. So mm. thank you all for listening to Discover Ag, where every Thursday we cover trending topics that you need to know in the ag and food space. If you enjoyed today's episode, please, please tell a friend, share it to your social channels, take a second to leave us a review. We love seeing those reviews. Um, leave them in the podcasting app. If you want more during the week from us, you can always follow us on Instagram at Discover Ag underscore um, and on our personal pages at Natalie Kovarik at Tara Vanderdeusen as well as our YouTube channel you can see our beautiful faces over there on YouTube Um, we are Discover Ag podcast see you next week see you on Thursday